I've made a few videos here and there on the fates of certain companions from Knights of the Old Republic and they've mainly been shorts, but I wanted to make a full video that encapsulates all of them and goes a little bit more into depth on their fates in general. Now this is going to include the characters from both Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2, this is going to talk about everybody, and of course the main characters, the Jedi Exile and Revan, but I won't go into detail about those because it's already pretty well known. I'm also going to include Atris. So, let's get right in and start with Knights of the Old Republic 1. So, most of us know what happened to Revan, but I'll go over it briefly. He left to go to the Unknown Regions, he got captured by the Sith and was imprisoned for hundreds of years. He then got freed from that prison, but he went insane and tried to commit genocide twice, but he was ultimately killed and his soul got split in half. His light side became one with the Force, but his darkness decided to carry on and inhabited his body so he could kill the Emperor, but he failed. And then he did accept death fully and he became one with the Force. Now, for what we're here for, the Companions, let's start with the most important companion of Knights of the Old Republic, Bastila Shan. After the events of KOTOR, Bastila became very disillusioned with the Jedi Order for the way that they treated Revan. They kind of treated him as a heretic because he and Bastila got married, but they also had him publicly as a Jedi Master because of what he did for the galaxy and what he represented to the Jedi. The Jedi were being extremely hypocritical because they were privately treating him like rubbish and Bastila hated them for this and didn't actually engage with the Jedi Order for a long time despite being considered a part of it. She eventually fell pregnant but Revan left to find a hidden threat in the Unknown Regions that he wanted to stop so he could protect his family and in secret she programmed T3M4 to actually return to her should anything happen to him, which he was intending to do until the Ebon Hawk got hijacked at the beginning of KOTOR 2 and he found Mitra instead. Now as we all know, Revan never returned and some time after the birth of their son, who she named Vanna in honour of her husband, she was forced to go into hiding when the Sith Triumvirate rose to power and started to systematically kill off the Jedi. When she learned of the Jedi Exile's presence, she still decided to stay hidden for the sake of her son and of course Mitra brought down the Sith Triumvirate and ended the Dark Wars and as instructed, T3M4 returned to Bastila with the Jedi Exile in tow and the two of them discussed Revan's fate thanks to T3M4 who gave them the knowledge. And although she wanted to help rescue Revan from the Sith Empire, she decided to put her son first and she basically tasked Mitra with going into the Unknown Regions and saving the day again. And she gave her the mask of Darth Revan, which she had hidden from him all of these years out of fear that it would return him to his original dark persona. From there on, after the reconstruction of the Jedi Order by the Jedi Exile's companions, Bastila decided to return to the Jedi and she was anointed as a Jedi Master. At one point during her tenure, she placed her entire thought pattern into a Jedi artifact known as the Noeticon of Secrets, which harboured the memories and thought patterns of many Jedi who had fallen to the dark side but returned to the light, as a guide for any future Jedi who were suffering from the same problem. And fortunately for Bastila, this version of the Jedi Order wasn't as strict or hypocritical as the original, and even though she was engaged in their affairs, she spent the majority of the rest of her life focused on her family. Next up is Karth Onassi. After the events of KOTOR, he joined the Republic military and became an admiral in the Republic Navy for his heroism in the war against Darth Malak. However, with the rise of the Sith Triumvirate some years later, Karth essentially became desperate and he actually engineered the situation in which the Jedi exile would be brought back into known space. However, he didn't want to control the Jedi Exile's actions, he simply wanted to bring her back and observe to see what she would do, and of course she went on to battle the Sith, and he led the Republic military in the battle for Telos against Darth Nihilus, which is also essentially him facing his past. After the death of Nihilus, he met with Mitra, desperate for some answers about Revan's fate, which she didn't actually have at this point, and then he asked her to simply send Revan a message, which was that he was following his orders and protecting the Republic. To my knowledge, he continued to serve the Republic Navy, and we know that Tatooine was one of a number of planets where he was rumoured to have died and been buried. Now, what happened to Jolie Bindo? Jolie himself did rejoin the Jedi Order to an extent, however not fully. Much like he did originally, Jolie had a desire to pursue his own knowledge, and he essentially went outside of the Jedi's jurisdiction, but would sometimes re-engage with the Order itself. 
However, several years after the first game, he actually completely disappeared and was never seen again or mentioned in any bit of media, so his fate is completely unknown. However, we can assume that he didn't die by the hand of Darth Nihilus because we can find his robes in the game and the description is pretty clear in saying that his whereabouts are unknown and that he wasn't dead, but that's just my assumption. As for everybody's favourite cat girl Juhani, well we can only consider that her fate on the other hand wasn't particularly positive. After the game, Juhani did fully rejoin the Jedi Order and she restarted her training as a full Jedi. This was referenced in the Revan novel. But as KOTOR 2 suggests, almost every single Jedi was killed and hunted down, and unlike Joe Lee, I can't imagine Juhani being a character that would have gone into hiding after her journey with Revan. So based on this information, my best guess would be that Juhani was unfortunately killed in the Jedi Purge along with the rest of them. Now I'm going to count Zalbar and Mission as one here because their fates intertwine. After the events of KOTOR, the inseparable pair created a business together. This was an import-export business for goods and over the next few years, this became relatively successful and we can only assume that the two lived in peace as they were no longer directly involved in major galactic affairs that would affect their lives. And Revan even mentions this in the novel, saying that he didn't want to drag them into his journey to find the Sith because he didn't want to affect their lives any further than he had already done. Kandorus Ordo, on the other hand, actually went on another adventure with Revan after the events of KOTOR to search for the Mask of Mandalore on the planet Rekiad. It was revealed that Kandorus actually had a wife and that many of the Mandalorian clans were on this planet searching for that very mask which Revan hid there after the events of the Mandalorian Wars so they could build the Mandalorians. Unfortunately though, the Mandalorians wanted Kandorus to betray Revan when they found the mask, to which he refused and they actually ended up killing Kandorus' wife and the Mandalorians that were with her. Revan then gave him the mask of Mandalore and instructed him to rebuild the Mandalorian clans, but in a way that brought honour to them rather than as a bunch of warlords who conquered and invaded. So Kandorus refit the Mandalorian mask into a suit of armour and became Mandalore the Preserver and reinstated their power base on Duxon and began to reunite the clans and this is who we see in the sequel. After KOTOR 2, Mandalore did indeed continue to build the power base of the Mandalorians and he was instrumental in ensuring that by the time of the Old Republic, the Mandalorian faction was an extremely powerful entity. And we know that Kandorus was killed some years after Knights of the Old Republic 2, after he was attacked by a weapon that pierced through his helmet and went through his skull, killing him instantly. However, after his death, many of the Mandalorians over time lost their way and became divided, and there were splinter factions throughout history known as the Preservers that tried to keep Kandorus' legacy intact. Now for our favourite assassin droid. After the events of KOTOR 1, Revan wiped HK-47's memory core and left him with Bastila, who in turn left HK-47 with the Jedi Council in an attempt to calm him. But this didn't go very well, and when he probed Bastila about Revan's whereabouts, she refused to tell him, so he left and decided to go and find Revan himself. But this didn't go very well and HK-47 was severely damaged at some point during his search and some of his parts were scattered across the galaxy. However, T3M4 managed to recover most of what was left and stored him on the Ebon Hawk, where he was eventually found by the Jedi Exile. After KOTOR 2, it was revealed that it was his programming that was compelling him to find Revan all the time, and so he left Mitra Surik and went again on a hunt for his original master. He then spent the next 300 years searching, and funnily enough, it was Revan that actually found him when he was freed from his prison, and he put him in control of an ancient Rakatan weapon known as the Foundry to build an army of war droids. However, just before HK arrived at the Foundry, he was captured by an operative known as the Shroud, who had actually copied HK's memory core and had a number of copies of the assassin droid built. The original HK wasn't aware of this, but he was eventually destroyed on the Foundry by the Sith Empire, who took his remains and reconstructed and reprogrammed him to serve Darth Malgus. Unfortunately though, he wasn't fully ready, but he was activated to repel a Republic strike force and was once again destroyed. 
But despite the fact that the original was destroyed, there were a number of Shroud HK-47 copies that still existed, and one of these copies was actually acquired by Revan after he went insane, and he was used to defend a Sith artifact known as the Temple of Sacrifice on Yavin 4 so that Revan could commit genocide and reawaken the Sith Emperor. Again though, he was destroyed, this time by a coalition of some of the most powerful Empire and Republic forces, and this would be the last time he ever interacted with Revan. Another copy of HK-47 became trapped on Mustafar on a downed Republic Hammerhead cruiser for thousands of years, and he was actually reawakened by the Separatists, and then went on to try and build an army of assassin droids to take over the galaxy, but this failed miserably. Now we have reached T3M4. His fate is the most heartbreaking of all of the companions in KOTOR in my opinion. T3 was undyingly loyal to Revan, and after KOTOR 1 when they travelled to Nathema to learn about the Sith, Revan was ultimately captured, and T3 was forced to stay on the planet alone for years to rebuild the Ebon Hawk with scraps. He then of course returns to known space and finds the Exile. After the events of KOTOR 2, he follows the Exile back to Nathema to try and discover where the Sith took Revan, and they learn that he was taken to the Sith capital of Droman Kars and he, alongside Mitra and a Sith traitor called Scourge, broke Revan out of prison where he was being held by one of the Sith Dark Council called Darth Nyrus. They then pushed on and decided to go and attempt to kill the Sith Emperor, and as Revan was engaged in battle with him, the Jedi was being overwhelmed. And so T3M4 charged the Sith Emperor and set him alight using his flamethrower, which completely broke the Emperor's focus and hold on Revan, which essentially saved Revan's life. But then, the Sith Emperor used the Force and obliterated T3 into tiny fragments, and Revan and Mitra were defeated regardless. Now we're going to move on to the KOTOR 2 companions. Unlike the companions of KOTOR 1, the companions of KOTOR 2 all have very similar fates because all of them went on to rebuild the Jedi Order and they became founding Jedi. But they do have certain differences, so let's delve in. So as a quick overview for the Jedi Exile, she travels into the Unknown Regions with T3M4 and follows in Revan's footsteps to the planet known as Nathema, where she finds out that Revan was captured by a Sith Lord called Darth Nyrus and taken to the Sith capital of Dromund Kars. Mitra travels to this planet and discovers a Sith Lord known as Scourge who wants to help her break Revan free, as he had become somewhat acquainted with Revan over the years. They of course do break Revan free and he kills Darth Nyrus and then they decide their best option is to attack the Sith Citadel and take out the Emperor. There is a battle to get into the throne room and when they do, all three of them are standing in front of the Emperor and Scourge has a vision of the future that shows a Jedi that isn't either Revan or Mitra as the one who would be victorious over the Emperor. So in an attempt to ensure that this future comes true, he steps to the side and kills Mitra by stabbing her in the back so he can prove his loyalty to the Emperor and become his right hand man, and then Revan is captured and Mitra becomes a ghost. However, the Force Ghost of Mitra stays alongside Revan in the Maelstrom prison for 300 years to keep him somewhat sane, and then she reaches out to the Jedi Order of the Old Republic and assists them in freeing him. Let's start this with Kreia. Now, while you would assume that Kreia's story was finished after the events of KOTOR 2 because she dies, one of the quest lines in the Old Republic features a character known as the Entity. The description of this character matches Kreia in that she was a centuries old Sith Lord who had the ability to see the future and almost destroyed the Jedi. And while this character is not directly said to be Kreia, there are many hints towards it. And while writing the game, Drew Carpishan, who didn't directly work on this questline but worked with those who did, was under the impression that this character was supposed to be Kreia. But I want to say that whoever wrote this character and intended it to be Kreia needs an absolute slap round the face because it's the biggest disservice to a character I've ever seen in my life. This entity was in love with the Emperor and essentially did everything that she did to get his attention. So it is absolute nonsense if this is Kreia. Shame on the writers. Atten's fate is ambiguous, not much is known about it at all, but we do know that he became an integral member in the founding of the new Jedi Council and became a Jedi Master. 
Visas Ma also went on to become a founding member of the New Jedi Council and played an influential role in its reconstruction. It was also claimed that she returned to Qatar, her homeworld which was destroyed by Nihilus, and finally learned to come to terms with what had happened. Now, the Disciple went on to become one of the Jedi Order's greatest known historians, and this is referenced in a tiny little description in the Old Republic. He actually created a holocron, which he had hidden in a Jedi archive in an asteroid field known as the Kron Drift, and this holocron was found by the Jedi Order in the Old Republic. When the Lost Jedi are referenced, he is always kind of referenced as the main Jedi of the group, so we can only assume that he went on to become the Jedi Grand Master, but this isn't confirmed in any media, that's just my assumption. As for Beodor, he's a highly contested topic. The original intent was to have Beodor die while he was helping HK with the HK manufacturing plant on Telos. However, this was cut from the original game, and so his inevitable fate in that regard was also cut from the canon story. This is also further backed up by the fact that Kreia refuses to elaborate on his future, which is kind of left open-ended. However, external source media suggests that every Force-sensitive companion that can be turned into a Jedi did indeed become a Jedi and went on to rebuild the Order. So we can only attribute this to Beodor as well, and assume that he survived and went on to become a founding member of the new Jedi Council. Mira, much like the rest of the Jedi Companions, went on to re-establish the Jedi Council, and she left bounty hunting behind. It was also suggested that she died many years later on a planet that was forgotten, what this means I don't know, however she dies, saving the lives of others, and that she does this without regret. As for Brianna, you guessed it, she became an influential member of the New Jedi Order and one of its founders. It was said that her experience with Atris would actually lead her down the path of a historian, and she chose to let go of her Achani battle prowess to become a teacher. Speaking of Atris, she decided that she needed to suffer the same fate as the Jedi Exile, and that she needed to let go of being a Jedi, and to be exiled and to rediscover herself as a human. After the events of KOTOR 2, she was held captive in her sanctum on Telos, and she waited there until she could be judged by Mikal and the new Jedi Council. Again, this kind of indicates that Mikal was the leader, so perhaps the Grand Master. But anyway, we can only assume that this was the eventual case, and that Atris was exiled and simply disappeared to history. As for Goto, he was destroyed on Malachor, however his photoreceptor somehow survived, and it was treated as a treasured relic several hundred years in the future. And the same goes for Hanha, he was killed by Mira on Malachor in the canon story. And last but not least, Beodor's remote, who was the most important character in the whole game, was destroyed on Malachor. Whew, this video was a lot longer than I intended it to be, I thought this would be a pretty quick one, but alas, that wasn't the case. Regardless, if you did go on to enjoy it, don't forget to hit the like button to tell YouTube that you had a wonderful time with this video, and if you love Knights of the Old Republic, perhaps consider subscribing to join the biggest growing KOTOR community on YouTube. I'll see you guys in the next video, but until then, may the Force be with you. Always.